in today's uh, in today's world? Well, thanks for asking that conversation. Can I see? Do you guys have a video? Because we're right. I'm still sure. I have. Oh, sorry. There, there we go. Can you see us Perfect. now? Perfect. Well, I think that is a great question, but I have a question first off for all of your students, which is in the last, uh, let's say the last week, how many of you have seen a movie? Uh, wow. All right. A, ma a, ma a, ma a majority of them have seen a movie, yes. Yes, I figured. <laughs> how many of you have watched television? Played a video game? Uh, okay, I'm not going to ask if you've read the New York Times. I'm more focused on, did you watch the movie? So, if you're spending this much time on something, I think it's worth figuring out what that thing is. Most young people in Western cultures spend an enormous amount of time interacting with media, whether it's movies, television shows, video games, online chats, online uh, YouTube, whatever they do on, you know, however you interface with people online. You spend an enormous part of your life in that sector. And so it seems helpful to me when you think about how your life is being influenced and are the things that are shaping you as a person to look at this sector where you're spending a lot of your time. Many people, are they? Sorry, miss, go ahead. Go ahead. Many people tend to think of their life in these sort of chunks where you go to school or have a job or you have some other commitment. Sorry, just the audio is breaking up uh, quite a bit at your end. With movies, it's like it's a set. And in fact, sorry, I know the picture's breaking up a little bit too. Yeah. But in fact, when you think about all of that stuff that you entertainment, what you find is that. So many of the things that you think about that shape who you are, that you talk about during the day when you're doing that more serious stuff, actually come from all that media. So when you're at school, how many times do you talk about a TV show you saw or a YouTube video you saw or uh, uh, a show you watched or something else? Those things infuse the part of your life that you think of. And D, they shape life. And so what we find through a lot of research about media is that, especially for young people, the, the ideas that are present in media have a great deal of influence on how you think about yourself, how you think about the world around you, how you think about the people you meet. And part of the reason they have so much influence is that you don't think they matter. You're not thinking about them critically. You're not looking at it in the way you might look at a high school teacher. What does he know? I'm not, I have no idea what, you know, he doesn't know what's really going on. In a movie, and he, this is no big deal, it's just entertainment. So all the ideas and assumptions that are coming through from that movie are actually infusing your life more powerfully because you're not thinking about them critically. You're not thinking that this is something that you're being given a proposition to say, do you agree or disagree? It's entertainment. Why do you need to think about it? So most of my scholarship has been about asking people to think about media and the way they think about everything else in their lives, to think about it critically, to look at someone and say, why are you telling me that? Why should I believe what you are saying to me? Why should I the ideas that you've just put forward. Because you tend to do that in class. You do that certainly, I suspect, with your parents. You do. You have a lot of very healthy skepticism. 
And mostly what I'm asking you to do is take that skepticism to the media. Why is it that the media wants me to think about the way men and women interact in certain ways, the way that men are expected to behave in certain ways, the ways that people we think about who our enemies are? in certain ways. Why does the media want me to think about that in this way? And to bring that kind of healthy skepticism to the thing that you think of as not really mattering because it's entertainment. That's mostly what I try to do in my work. And um, I'm not sure if you want, Anthony, for me to talk a bit more about that or to switch to a different subject. No, I have questions. Tell what you like. Does, well, first, does anyone have questions? Uh, does anyone have questions about what Dr. Jefford was saying? Mm -hmm. I think it's it's one of those things where we talked uh, extensively about what you just shared and what I you know what I what I you know my own studies which which stems from your writing and such uh, about uh, about media and I I will say I, I think it was a challenge in, in some ways uh, because I think boys boys minds in my own uh, in my growing experience this is my first year in an all boys school uh, it, it's wired I think a little bit differently and and when they're consuming that when they're consuming that information I think definitely what you're saying. Uh, is so true. They're not. They're not necessarily reading it as something more. They're just consuming. It's a. They're consuming it as entertainment. Almost just like uh, I always say, an analogy of a McDonald's value meal. They're they're taking it in. It tastes really good at the yes. moment, but there's nothing really nutritious there unless you start breaking down and start looking at what you're really eating, right? So, we've studied a lot about gender. We're an all boys school, and the guys know how I feel about this. We're an all boys school where sports culture plays an important role. Uh, in the building. I'm not athletic. I don't have an athletic bone uh, in me. I'm more arts driven and um, I think it's important for men to have, especially young men, to have different interpretations and definitions of masculinity. And this is where your, some of your readings and other, other folks that I've brought into the course have played an important role. Why now? Um, or is there an urgency now, uh, as it always has been, for, for us to have a new, perhaps, interpretation of masculinity. Why is, say, in an all-boys school, would it be important to examine a film like Die Hard and, and read it for its rendering of how the male's, how the male's structured? What, why should they be concerned about these definitions and how they pertain to them? Mm. Well, I think that's, that's a great question. I think the, the why now, so much of my work has been not only to focus on gender or to focus on masculinity, but to also see how they intersect with militarism, with the idea of a culture that's prone to solving problems through violent confrontation and war. And that is our culture right now. We are so embedded in it that we don't think of ourselves as a military culture. Uh, we indeed have the world's largest standing military. There is not, uh, I think before World War II, there was no such thing as a standing army. Armies were put together for the purpose of the war. But now we have come to accept that this country should have a permanent army, and we've shifted it to being a volunteer army. But it doesn't mean, in some ways, we've come to accept that this is just a part of who we are as a nation. Not every nation thinks this way. Not every culture has to think this way. And since the bulk of the military is comprised of men, it's certainly become more open to women. The bulk of the military is still comprised of men. That's one place where it's really important for young men in particular to think about uh, the military. And I know that certain are different in Canada than they are in the United States, but they're similar enough that I think focusing on why the military is constructed the way it is and why men aren't thinking about themselves in relation to the military is an important thing for any young male to think about. But how, how does your future thinking about yourself intersect with concepts of warfare and antagonism and violent confrontation? Can I, can I jump in there for a second? Do you mind if I just jump in on what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, okay, so if you can hear me. So 
I'm not sure if you heard uh, Dr. Jeffords very well, but she was reinforcing this idea of, uh, of the military and militarism and, and our connection to that, that idea of violence. And obviously she's in the States, and even though the United States Army is much larger than us and there's a different philosophy, there's a lot of political conversation about how our Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, is becoming much more aligned to big ideas around uh, our, our foreign policy and our military and the role of our army. And we're an act of battle. It's no longer Canada the bystander. We are in active battle. We are flying with the Americans. We are in battle with the Americans. But importantly, think about conversations we had in class the other day about, you know, if uh, fights in a school or fights over how we react, right? That, that's all militarized kind of violent behavior. So your friend gets, you know, um, something happens to your friend in a cafeteria and then there's a violent reaction. What's the point of that? Where does that come from? Right? Why do we feel the need to react in that particular way? And if I, tell me if I'm off course here, Dr. Jeffords, but I think that's very much connected to how we have consumed and identified ourselves as male. Yes, absolutely. It's the question of, you know, there's a, as we think about our own behavior, I know we, we think of ourselves as intact individuals, but we are also shaped by the people around us, the expectations that people have of us. What is it that our friends think of what we're saying or doing? What is our family? What does our school think? What does our culture think about how we're behaving? And those interactions that, that shape us, those expectations, are informed so much by media. So when you are in a situation where someone, you have disagreement. The impulse to how do you respond to that? Do you respond to it physically? Do you respond to it emotionally? Do you walk away from that? Those decisions are shaped by peers, by family members, by culture, and by the media. All of them informed by media. What's the expectation? The phrase that you hear so often, be a man, what in the heck does that mean? Where does that come from? Why do we say that to young males? Does that actually mean to people? Is that a positive thing? Is it a negative thing? Generally, it's taken as a correction. You need to be a man. Change your... What you're doing, what it means to be a man. Is that something you want? Is that something you think is the right path for your life? People are saying this to you all the time. That's uh, actually as as you were saying that uh, I turned to the back of the I turned to look at the boys and they were nodding their head. They were, they were they were I think taking taking that comment in because I'm sure we've all you know I've definitely heard that growing up and I'm sure they have as well. Now just one maybe just one more question just because of the uh, the the Skype seems to be I, I want to hold on to the Skype as long as I can. What role, I think, we've, we've studied Die Hard quite extensively, um, uh, trying to get back to the kind of the, the non-superhero type of action film, so I brought the, I've introduced them to Die Hard, and a lot of these guys wouldn't have seen it, because it's well before their time, but now that I'm talking to you, know, we're talking to you, we're talking about this idea of male codes, we're talking this idea about the connection to the military, uh, a few of the guys, they've seen American Sniper, you've seen, some of you have seen it. $105 million uh, uh, in, in an opening weekend for a non-superhero film. What, when something like that does so well, when a film like American Sniper does so well in the box office, what does it, what does it say about the cultural pulse of the time? What, what, why is that type of box office number significant for that type of film? And I'm not sure if you've seen it or not, but it's, um, it's still pretty interesting. I missed the time. Sorry, what's that? I missed the film you're talking about. Uh, Amer uh, American Sniper. Uh, have you heard about the box office that I brought in this weekend? Oh. That Clint, the new Clint, yes, the, the new, the new Clint Eastwood yes. film. What does it yeah. say about when a film like American Blo American Sniper makes a hundred million dollars uh, on the weekend, or even a, a superhero film, when something does well? in the box office, and, and that's what a lot of, you know, yeah. a lot of casual moviegoers look at. What is that saying about the cultural arena or the political arena? What, what does it say about us as, as a people yeah. going to the theater? Well, I think it's reinforcing all of these things that we've talked about. We 
if you think about why you go to see a movie, it's because you, it gives you some emotional pleasure. What gives you emotional pleasure? Things that reinforce your feeling of who you are and give you, or give you a chance to explore parts of your life that you otherwise can't. So very violent films. Why do people enjoy going to see them? Because it gives us a chance to express something that, um, that we can't express in our daily lives. So there's an emotional gratification that we get from going to films because they affirm either who we are now or some part of us we would like to be able to um, exercise. So films like that give us a chance to feel that way. I was just watching again the other day The Equalizer. I don't know if any of you saw that, Denzel Washington. It's a big time revenge film. And I spent decades studying this stuff and I have to tell you, I watched that movie and I felt really good that he, he got away, you know, he got back at those bad guys. And I think about this stuff all the time. And I was emotionally sucked into that film and I was just, that he sought revenge. We feel this way when we go to movies. It's hard not to. I'm not saying go to a movie and don't experience what they are so good at encouraging you to experience. I'm saying go to the movie, have that experience, and then sit back and say, why did I feel that way? So I finished watching that movie and thought, why did I feel that way? Why did I enjoy this kind of revenge so much? What is it about my life and my feelings that resonated with that? So it's not change the movies. They're just going to be what they are. It's change how you respond to them after you see them and think about what it means for your life. Do you want that kind of model that you see in Guardians of the Galaxy or uh, any of the big action films? Do you want, is that your version of yourself? And give yourself an opportunity to say, that's actually not what I want. I want something different. And make a choice. Don't allow me to make choices for you. That's mostly what I do my work for, is to encourage people to think skeptically about the media so that they can actually make decisions about their lives and not have their lives shaped unknowingly. Fantastic. Now, one more question. Your, you, you, that text, Hard Bodies, the masculinity in the Reagan era, how different, if you were going to write something on the Obama era, for example, uh, yeah. would, the, would the text be? And perhaps what kind of films, if you can give me maybe you know, one, two, or three films that really would kind of summarize the Obama era now going into its uh, fifth or sixth year? Well, I actually think American Sniper is one of those films because the film opens up the possibility for this man to be tortured by his feelings, his regret, his emotions, um, the loss of, uh, in terms of his family, the sense of him not feeling hardened about what he's done, but actually being traumatized by what he's done. I think that's very typical of this era now in a way that wasn't typical for the Reagan era. Uh, 